Well, I'm happy to know I'm prescribing um, the hormone replacement adequately, <laughs> hormone therapy. Uh, it's interesting when you're, when you're sitting in the audience and you hear the speaker and you think, oh, I do that. Isn't that good? Yes, it validates what you're doing. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about uh, osteoporosis and thyroid disease here for a bit. There are no disclosures, no investigational use, and we're going to take a look at starting and stopping osteoporosis therapy. One of the big things that the Bone and Mineral Society is pushing this year is please think about treating your patients with osteoporosis. Uh, since uh, atraumatic fractures came onto the picture, people have stopped using bisphosphonate, and that's been a terrible disaster because hip fracture in the United States has actually gone up a bit since that happened. And we're going to talk about uh, treating thyroid disease in the older patient. First of all, this is a 55-year-old lady who, and these are all cases, these cases are real. These are my cases, okay? 55-year-old lady who tripped over her dog drool and fractured her right hip. Dog drooled on the kitchen floor, she slipped. DEXA scan showed a lowest T-score to be minus 2.1 at the left femoral neck. Should you treat her? How many people say yes? Yes? Yes, you should treat. She has osteoporosis, right? How with the bisphosphonate? The question, does she have osteoporosis? In the United States, that's a little tough. In Europe, they'd say for sure she fell and fractured her hip. Fell from a standing height, fractured her hip. She has osteoporosis. We were a little behind on that. We said, well, look, look, the DEXA says she has osteopenia. And a lot of people with hip fractures were not treated. But now, as of last year, the Bone and Mineral Society said, hey, look, you fall from a standing height and fracture your hip, you have osteoporosis here. So again, what minimal lab are you going to obtain before you treat anyone for osteoporosis? Anyone. You're going to need a creatinine because remember, renal insufficiency causes bone disease and you can treat people with bisphosphonate and make them worse if they have stage four and five renal disease. You have to be careful. You need to track the calcium. You need to know if they don't have a normal calcium, you need to fix the problem because otherwise your treatment for osteoporosis really doesn't work very well. And you need to get the 25-hydroxy-D. If you treat osteomalacia from D deficiency with bisphosphonate, again, it doesn't work well. So we need to fix the vitamin D deficiency, the calcium disorders first, and make sure the patient has adequate kidney function to take the medication for osteoporosis. So if those labs are normal, you're going to use a bisphosphonate. And interestingly, now our order set, when you come out of the hospital with a hip fracture, gets those three labs. If they're normal, you go out on a bisphosphonate. So we're trying very hard to improve our score. It was about 13% of the people were treated a couple of years ago. Now we're up to about 50% of the people. So bisphosphonate's OK. The, Bone and Mineral Society guidelines say that you initiate treatment in postmenopausal women and, I, and men who are over the age of 50, 50 or more, who have a, had a hip or vertebral fracture that's a fragility fracture, fall from a standing height, picking up something that was too heavy and fracturing a vertebra. Again, those people are treated. It doesn't matter what the DEXA scan shows. In fact, you don't even need a DEXA scan. Just move on, treat those people. Also, any other prior fracture with a low bone mass. So if the T-score is low and you fractured your wrist, if you fractured your shoulder, a fragility fracture, you're going to treat it. And again, T-score of less than 2.5 was the World Health Organization definition of osteoporosis. We're going to treat those people and so on. People on steroids, secondary cause. Steroids is the most are the most common secondary cause in the United States. We're going to treat them. And finally, we're going to think about using FRAX. How many of you use FRAX? Good, OK, that's great. It comes as an app, uh, and, and I just put it down on the bottom of my computer screen when I start in the morning. So again, we're going to use that, and Medicare will pay if the 10-year risk for major osteoporotic fractures is 20% or the 10-year hip fracture risk is 3%. Then you're going to be able to get any medication for osteoporosis that you want paid for, in part at least, with Medicare. Okay, now let's ask the FRAX. This is a 64-year-old lady whose DEXA scan showed a T-score of minus 2.3. So that's osteopenia, right? She's had no fracture. She didn't slip on the floor. She didn't have any hip fracture. And her height is 64 inches, and her weight's 160 pounds. 
Now her calcium, her D level, and her creatinine are normal. What are her other risk factors? She has type 2 diabetes and an A1C of 10%. You say, wait a minute, you're on the wrong day. That was yesterday. Ah, uh -uh. bone disease. Type 2 diabetes is an inflammatory state and it, it decreases structural integrity of the bone matrix. So those people have a higher risk. She doesn't smoke cigarettes or drink alcohol. Mother had a hip fracture at age 96. That counts in fracs, right? She had menopause at age 52. She's fairly far out. And she had no arthritis, she has no steroids. And she's about to have two dental implants because she had some problems with her teeth, had, had, is going to have extractions and implants. Should she be treated? Oh gosh, she doesn't seem to have osteoporosis, does she? T scores minus 2.3, no fragility fracture. So she's the person in whom you're going to use FRAX. You're going to ask the FRAX. Remember that FRAX is a World Health Organization database developed by Dr. John Canis, and it really predicts the 10 year risk of fracture pretty well. There are some problems with it, but it uses the standard classical risk factors, including rheumatoid arthritis, including secondary causes of osteoporosis. If you want to make that a little better for your patients with early menopause, you can tick off secondary osteoporosis makes it a little more accurate. And those are the numbers we talked about, 20% major osteoporotic fracture, 3% hip fracture. What are the problems with FRAX and the DEXA here? They underestimate type 2 diabetes risk because we said it's an inflammatory response. And so what you can do, they looked at this database and they said, how can we make this better? How can we make it more accurate for people with diabetes, particularly type two diabetes? You can click on the rheumatoid arthritis box and put that in as a risk factor. It helps to, in your patient with diabetes because it helps to make FRAX more accurate for the diabetic patient. Or you can take a look at the T-score Remember, you can use FRAX without a DEXA, but you say you've got FRAX with a DEXA. Okay, you're gonna say, okay, I'm gonna take that DEXA score, I'm gonna subtract 0.5 from the T-score and put it in that way. And those are, those are really pretty accurate ways to help FRAX modify to help you with diabetes. And so let's recalculate here. You said, okay, I subtracted 0.5 from the T-score, uh-oh, now it's down to minus 2.8. Do we need FRAX? Do you treat people with uh, T-scores of minus 2.8 with uh, this? Well, you bet you do. Oh, thank you, Dr. Phillips, nodding in the front row. <laughs> Good, keep nodding. Okay, so we're gonna do that. So we didn't even have to use FRAX here if we just subtracted. But if we put the, it took the original FRAX score was uh, 15 for MOF and uh, for hip fracture was one. And we added the RA risk factor and put it in there again. Now our major osteoporotic fracture risk is 20%. So again, we're gonna treat that. So no matter how you do it, if you subtract 0.5 from the T-score or if you add in the uh, FRAX score and take a look at uh, your major osteoporotic and your hip fracture risk, you're going to be able to do it with the risk factor for RA. Okay, so if there are any questions about these, maybe I think Randy said I could kind of ask, answer them as we went along. Okay, okay, so that helps you out with diabetes. So what does diabetes do to bone? Well, ma mainly it's the type two people we're looking at when we're looking at uh, the perimenopausal and postmenopausal woman. And type two people, again, an inflammatory response. They have a bunch of insulin that helps them make bone, but they don't make bone as well because the hemoglobin A1C isn't just your hemoglobin glycosylated, all your body's proteins are glycosylated. And in fact, your bone matrix is glycosylated. And when it's glycosylated, it doesn't fit together as well. So the bone matrix in type two diabetes is poor. There's an inflammatory component, just like there is with rheumatoid arthritis. And so diabetes type two is a double whammy on your bones. Type one, easier to understand. They don't have much insulin except what you're giving them. So they don't build bone as well. Insulin is a growth factor in bone. So they don't build the matrix as well. And they don't mineralize as well. And they also have sarcopenia, muscle loss if they have neuropathy. So both type one and type two are a problem. Mostly you're gonna see it in the type two patient. So what are we gonna do? The bottom line here is the same as always. The A1C is better, the bones are better too. Okay, so should she start her medication today 
I said, geez, don't let him get out of your office without starting that medication. Well, shucks, no, she has an active dental issue. People with active dental issues should not be started on a bisphosphonate unless you can actually take care of those issues first because, um, as you know, we said she's about to have extractions and implants. It's because we want to prevent osteonecrosis of the jaw, which frightens patients, but really is a very rare thing. And how are we best going to prevent osteonecrosis of the jaw? By good oral hygiene. They found out that brushing your teeth is one of the best ways of preventing osteonecrosis of the jaw. Who'd have known it? Okay, so we're gonna correct the dental disease before we start the anti-resorptive agent. And in patients, say, say Mrs. Jones is already on a bisphosphonate. How many have had dentists call them? I have weekly dental calls. And they say, oh my gosh, the patient's on bisphosphonate. What can I do? I can't take out her teeth. Yeah, you can. You just take them out and you wait till the socket is healed. You start the bisphosphonate again. So you stop bisphosphonate and then you start it again when the socket is healed. And Dr. DePetty's laughing out there because, you know, bisphosphonate stays in the bone for five to seven years, right? <laughs> so what's stopping it for? But that was a um, compromise. The Dental Society and the Bone Mineral Society got together and they said, okay, just stop it until the socket heals. All right. So let's take a quick look at osteonecrosis of the jaw. Very low incidence, either in the osteoporotic population you have on bisphosphonate or in the general population. And so it's not a real concern in most patients. And if you're worried, you get a, a MRI or a cone beam CT, you can see it right away. There's no mystery about diagnosing osteonecrosis of the jaw. But the risk factors, again, poor oral hygiene, steroids, bisphosphonates, particularly at high dose for cancer, and of course, diabetes. So in your diabetic patient that you're gonna put on a bisphosphonate, be sure you send them to the dentist, be sure they take a look, because they're at higher risk, even on your low dose bisphosphonate, for having osteonecrosis of the jaw. And is that a life-threatening disease? No, you treat it. It's an infection of the bones, like an osteomyelitis of the jaw. But you don't want to have to treat it. You want to try and prevent it. So before you start bisphosphonate, make sure that your patient has seen the dentist and that they don't have active dental issues that require extraction. And implants, again, you're boring a hole in the jaw. You're going to need to wait for a little bit till they're totally healed before you start the bisphosphonate on this lady. Okay, moving on to the patient with steroids and steroids are the most common cause of secondary osteoporosis in the United States today. Steroids are a very potent destroyer of bone. They decrease your ability to absorb calcium from the gut. They decrease bone building. They accelerate bone destruction. They are a really overwhelming problem in terms of secondary osteoporosis. Okay, this is the 52-year-old lady taking long-term steroids, and she's taking 10 milligrams of prednisone daily. So 10 milligrams of prednisone, or its equivalent, is a significant risk factor for bone disease, according to the American Rheumatologic Society. Her DEXA scan, hmm, the T-score is minus 2.4 at the left femoral neck. And we do our FRAX calculation. Ah, hmm, well, she doesn't rate therapy, right? Well, we're a little worried though, minus 2.4 and you have her on prednisone. So FRAX doesn't adequately reflect steroids in high doses. It adequately reflects small amounts. As a matter of fact, if you're on less than two and a half milligrams and you're in calculating in the FRAX, you don't even have to tick off the glucocorticoid section. If you're at two and a half to seven and a half, the FRAX calculation covers that, and it's correct. You don't have to do anything except tick off the glucocorticoid box. If you're on more than seven and a half milligrams of prednisone, then you're going to have to increase your major osteoporotic risk or your hip fracture risk by either 15 or 20 percent. That's called the FRAX glucocorticoid adjustment. And I'd urge you to do that for your patients on high dose steroids because FRAX doesn't cut it with high dose steroids. So you have to increase, the simplest one is to increase your hip fracture uh, risk by 20%. So you get the hip fracture risk and you increase it. Okay, so let's take a look here at our patient and our DEXA. And we go down to the usual FRAX, okay? Her, she'd be 7.3% for major osteoporotic fracture and 0.6% for hip. So you're gonna adjust that. You're gonna go up by 15% on major osteoporotic or 20% on hip. 
and see that's where it puts her. So you're gonna go in there and do that. It's a little complicated, but your patients on steroids high dose are really worth the extra arithmetic. I found that uh, changing the hip fracture one is easy because I can do 20% in my head. 15%, oh, that went by a long time ago. Couldn't possibly do that. Okay, so then, once you've done that, you look at the 2017 guidelines for the American College of Rheumatology, and you see if your patient is low risk, moderate risk, or high risk. You say, oh, goodness, I don't have this much time in my office visit. Okay, so what you're gonna do is look down here, and how many of you treat premenopausal osteoporosis? Okay, good. How many of you treat postmenopausal osteoporosis? You all do. Well, there you go. If it's age 50 or more, she's automatically high risk. So you have to do the FRAX adjustment for glucocorticoids. When you get down here to deciding whether she's low risk, moderate risk, or high risk, all the patients you treat are gonna be high risk. There you go. So no problem. What do you do with high risk? They're high risk patients. You're gonna use exercise to increase muscle mass. We're gonna hear about that. Fall prevention, definitely incredibly important in steroid-treated patients because they have sarcopenia. Lifestyle changes, you're gonna get rid of the tobacco, you're gonna cut back on the alcohol if you need to. And then they're all gonna be high risk. So in the high risk patient, you're gonna use calcium, 1,000 to 1,200 milligrams a day. The recommendation is calcium citrate because uh, it is a little better absorbed, so perhaps a little better for them, and Rheumatologic Society suggested that. You're gonna use vitamin D, 600 to 800 IUs a day, and you're going to use either bisphosphonate, or if they can't use oral bisphosphonate, you can use zoledronic acid, which is very potent IV bisphosphonate, or you can use teriparatide, which is marketed as Forteo. But do please try and get those people at least on an oral bisphosphonate. Because all the people you're gonna see, essentially, since you treat postmenopausal osteoporosis, are going to be over the age of 50 or postmenopausal. And so they all fit into the high risk category on high dose steroids. And you may want to start, if they've ever had any problem with kidney stones, you may want to get a urine calcium because remember that steroids increase the urine calcium and can lead to renal stones. And so if they have a high urine calcium, you may want to start a tiny dose of hydrochlorothiazide. Usually 6.25 milligrams will do it. Gets the calcium out of the urine, into the bloodstream, into the bones. So that helps you out there. Okay, so we got that down. Okay. Okay, well, let's talk about steroids and osteoporosis for a minute. You say, well, I, is it the big dose? Is it the little dose? Well, it turns out that the uh, bone loss rate is not really proportional to the dose. As you can see, the 20 milligram dose there, some of the people start out with a lot of bone loss, but on the other hand, some of them are further down. And, and t less than 10 milligrams a day in blue, gosh, some of those people have a pretty rapid bone loss too. So it's hard to say, it's not the dose that counts so much as the dose plus the risk factors. So if you have a smoker you put on steroids, the bone mass loss is a lot more rapid than if she doesn't smoke. Patients use excessive alcohol. What do you think alcohol does, by the way? It decreases your osteoblastic functions. You don't build bone as well. So you don't remodel as well. So more than three ounces of alcohol a day is bad news for your ladies, particularly your postmenopausal ladies. So take a look. It's the dose of steroids plus the risk factors, the underlying risk factors that the patient has that determines the rate of loss of bone on steroids. What we do know is proportional to the dose is vertebral fractures. And hip fractures don't go up so much in steroids. It's mostly vertebral fractures that are the problem. And can we fix that? You bet. Now this is resedronate data. Remember, resedronate is actinel. It's marketed as actinel. But alendronate, marketed as Fosamax, does the same thing. So again, you don't have to worry. You put them on a bisphosphonate, it really does decrease the risk of fractures. And notice down here there's an absolute decrease in fractures of 11%. Now remember, 
Dr. DePetty's piddly little one and a half percent absolute risk decrease in heart attack yesterday, this is an absolute 11 percent decrease in risk. That's a very large decrease. So these protect your patient's bones. So if you have a patient on high dose steroids, be sure you take a look, look at your fracs. They're going to be postmenopausal. They're high risk. You want them on a bisphosphonate. You say, how long can I get away with? Well, more than three months on high dose, you really need to get in there and get those people on a bisphosphonate. And I suggest you get a DEXA scan at the beginning, and if they look like they have significant osteopenia, you want to put them on a bisphosphonate on the beginning of your steroid dosage. Okay, I'm going to take a look next at exercise and bone health. This is a 65-year-old lady with osteopenia, a T-score at the left femoral neck of minus 1.8. So that's moderately severe osteopenia. She has an increased fracture risk. She takes calcium. She takes vitamin D. And she walks a mile a day at a brisk pace. So this is a lady who's in pretty good shape. And she says, can I use exercise to build my bones? I hear that question a lot. I'll bet you do, too. I want the natural way. I want exercise and calcium. Good idea. Keep exercising. Because exercise improves balance. And it may build muscle in the teenage tennis player. That ship has sailed, folks. You're not going to build muscle mass in the 75-year-old lady, and you're not going to build bone mass in the 75-year-old lady by walking around the block. I'm sorry. It is really not going to work. However, exercise decreases the risk of fracture in these people, so they need to exercise. And why is it because they build bones and build muscle? No, it's because their balance is a heck of a lot better. They looked at, at hip fracture and physical activity, and again, any form of consistent exercise decreases your risk of hip fracture. You don't have to lift weights. You don't have to run around the block. You just have to move it. And there's no difference between strenuous and non-strenuous. You can move around the block faster or slower, depending on how you want to do it. You can lift small weights, but you don't need to uh, lift weights in order to get that benefit, because it's a balanced benefit. And this is a prospective non-randomized control study of exercise and fractures in early postmenopausal women. This is on the rapidly diminishing bone mass part of that hill we talked about. Remember, going up, important to have nutrition, calcium, protein, and vitamin D. As you come down, it's important to have calcium, adequate protein, and adequate vitamin D, and adequate exercise. Exercise slows the rate at which you lose bone mass during menopause. So it's very important to keep moving about there. And in this group, this was in Europe, the control group was told to maintain their activities. Now, I have to tell you, when we were in Europe the other day, I'm out walking in the morning. And so are a lot of other people. They're walking, they're bicycling, there are cars. This is in the middle of, of a big city in Europe. But there were a lot of bicycles and people walking. I was in New York the other day in the early morning taking my walk. I look around, there are 50 million cars. Uh, two bicycles, and one other person walking. So again, in Europe, the activity level is higher. So what I'm pointing out to you is that the control group was really pretty physically active. And they said to the other group, OK, we're going to get more activity on board. We're going to see what happens. And yes, low trauma fractures decreased in those people. They didn't fall down as much. In this, in this study, they didn't fall down as much. They didn't fracture as much. Again, statistically significant decrease in fractures in the people who were walking. I think this is the best study. It's a randomized prospective control study to see if targeted exercise and vitamin D reduced falls. And these people are older. They're 70 to 80 years old. So they're the people, they're women who are going to fall down. Okay. <laughs> And there are four groups, obviously, exercise of D, exercise no D, no exercise D, and no exercise and no D. And so these people were really pretty good. They looked at falls and fractures, and they looked uh, at the D levels, obviously, and, and the bone density. Oop, excuse me. So what were the results? Well, did people fall down less in any of these groups? No. There was no statistically significant difference in the number of falls in these elderly women. Elderly women fall down. Now, my husband says it's because we're clumsy. But that's not true. I think it's that women are looking at, uh, for other people, and they're so sensitive that they just aren't watching their feet. So they fall down more. 
But look at the next line, which is really the bottom line. There was a 50% decrease, a statistically significant decrease in injurious falls. If you have good balance, you fall down differently. You really do. The, the trajectory is different. The orthopedic people tell me that when you have good balance, you fall down, you're less likely to hurt yourself. And these people were almost half as much statistically significant decrease in injurious falls if you had decent balance. So again, uh, and, and it really doesn't have to be brisk walking. You can use Tai Chi. You can use simple yoga. OK. So again, we're going to change a bit and say, how long are we going to treat people with bisphosphonates? Hopefully, I've convinced you by now that you ought to tr start them out on bisphosphonates. We really ought to use those. They're very helpful medications. Millions of people worldwide have used them. There's a greater than 90% responder rate, and the hip fracture rate falls by nine months. In nine months, you statistically significantly decrease hip fracture in these people. So again, they're really effective medicines. Don't be afraid of them. And you can get a 50% decrease in hip fracture and over a 70% decrease in vertebral fractures. Decrease in vertebral fractures starts at about six months. So these are rapidly effective medications. They work. And they're safe for five years of use without any problems, sort of like estrogen. <laughs> okay, So if you're comfy prescribing that for five years, you should be comfortable prescribing bisphosphonates for five years. And IV is probably safe for about three to five years use. Now you say, well, what about these atypical fractures I've been hearing about? Mrs. Jones just oh, was standing up and just slipped and broke a hip. That's what we're going to talk about. Risk of atypical fracture after five years is about 16 per 100,000. By about nine years of continuous use, about 113 per 100,000. So really, if you look at risk of hip fracture, which is 750 to 830 per 100,000, big improvement even with these atraumatic fractures. And you say, well, but my patients, I'm not going to let my patients have atraumatic fractures. Good. I'll show you how to prevent them if we change here. OK, 70% of people who are going to get atraumatic fractures have bone pain first. And it's, it's, not, it's not achy joints. It's femoral bone pain. It's subtrochanteric bone pain. They say, oh, I just hurt down here. Whenever they say that to you, right away, x-ray. And just right on the x-ray, just right on a uh, bisphosphonate. <laughs> That's the simplest thing to do. Or a lendronate or phosphonex, whatever you're going to, they're on. Just write that in your little box that says comments when you send it down to the radiology department. And they will know exactly what to look for. These can be bilateral fractures. They can have delayed healing. What precipitates the risk? Vitamin D deficiency, rheumatoid arthritis, diabetes, again, inflammatory type 2 diabetes, low calcium intake, and of course, bisphosphonates and steroids. So all the things we've been talking about uh, here precipitate the atraumatic fracture. So you're just going to take a look at what they're on, particularly going to make sure they don't have vitamin D deficiency. and be sure their diabetes is as well controlled as possible and that their calcium intake is adequate. And again, if they're on bisphosphonates or steroids, their risk is higher. But get that x-ray because it really is helpful. These are stress fractures. And see, for the endocrinologist, you really need kind of arrows on the x-ray. So the radiologist helped me out there and said, there's a stress fracture, doc. So again, they are stress fractures. And what precipitates stress fractures? We talked about that a couple of days ago. Low calcium intake, low protein intake, low vitamin D. The same things in the older patient that precipitated stress fractures in the younger patient. And bisphosphonates don't make that any better. They make it a bit worse. And what happens is you can see the periosteal change on the x-ray. You send them to orthopedics, they rod both hips, and they prevent the fracture. So next question here is, when do we stop bisphosphonates? And I probably stop as much bisphosphonate as I start at the moment, just because people come to me after they've been on it for about five or 10 years. And 
look around your practice. If, if Mrs. Jones comes in and you say, well, how long have you been taking this alendronate? You probably will just make one of your questions of the day. And she says, oh, I don't remember. I started in about 2002. Right. And, you know, it's time. It's time to stop. I see a lot of patients that come into my practice and, and someone, that, their family medicine person has said to them, uh, how long have you been on this? And they said, oh, more than about 10 years. And they say, oh my goodness, well, what do I do now? Well, that's the big question. What do you do now? And we don't have a whole lot of data, but if your patient has had no previous fractures, they had no prevalent fractures when you started your bisphosphonate, and their T-score is above minus two and a half, they don't have osteoporosis anymore, then you can stop the bisphosphonate. If it is still minus two and a half or lower, and they still have osteoporosis, continue the bisphosphonate. You need to look every three to five years. And you know, and they, you can continue the bisphosphonate for the next three years. But take a look. Ask them how long they've been on it. Take a look at their DEXA and look at their T-score, because that's what the FDA suggests we use. If the patient has prevalent fractures, then you really can't stop until their T-score is above minus two, because the risk is higher in those patients. So again, no fractures, minus two and a half or lower, you're going to keep them on it. A fracture in the past, then you're going to wait till their T-score is above minus two for your drug holiday. The others you're going to continue. Okay, this is the newest uh, actual look at the data. It was done in 2017, and they looked at all of the bisphosphonate data. The previous slide was the FDA looking at alendronate data, which alendronate, Fosamax, was the first bisphosphonate that was really widely used. And this is all of the data up to 2017, and they really had no changes. If the patient hasn't had a fracture, then you really uh, can stop. If they don't have osteoporosis anymore, if they have had a fracture, you ought to continue on if they're not above minus two. So hasn't changed over the last three or four years. When is the drug holiday over? Well, you get a DEXA scan in a couple of years, and if they've lost a significant amount of bone, you have to put them back. You can put them back on bisphosphonate now, right? Right, because they now have bone turnover. The problem for which you stopped it is they get bone suppression. After about five to eight or 10 years, people begin to have bone suppression on bisphosphonates. They shut off remodeling. And when you shut off remodeling, you're more likely to get stress fractures. So again, this is, this is a, a problem where you have caused bone suppression. And when you begin to have bone turnover and you lose a significant amount of bone, is the bone suppressed anymore? No, <laughs> it's, it's moving, it's turning over again. So you can uh, get them back on a bisphosphonate. ACE suggests you might want to use a bone destruction marker. You can use an NTX or a CTX. They're the uh, NT low end and the CT low end of the matrix. And when you break down bone matrix, those go out in the urine. And so you can measure them either the urine is more convenient and less expensive, or you can measure them in the serum. But most insurance companies don't pay for those yet. If you're interested in bone markers, I'll be happy to talk about them during the question and answer period. Some people use FRAX. In England, they use FRAX to decide. But in the United States, we don't feel that that's valid. OK. How many of you use denosumab? Okay, goodly number of you, okay. Its main function is that you can use it in renal insufficiency. And so if your patient has stage 3B or even stage 4 and 5 uh, renal disease, you can use denosumab quite safely. You have to remember, big thing when you're using denosumab, it doesn't allow you to get calcium out of the bones. You must tell your patient they have to take their calcium every single day because their blood calcium is dependent upon their calcium intake orally. You can't just mobilize it from your bones when you're on denosumab. Now, when you're on a bisphosphonate, you can kind of get it out of the bone. But when you're on denosumab, no, you can't. So again, very, very important to tell them to take their calcium. The other thing is there's no drug holiday indicated because genosumab has a turnover rate. And if you're over six months, you begin to lose bone. It's like estrogen. You stop it, you begin to lose bone. So if you are using it, you need to make sure the patient stays on it 
and that they come for their appointments in a timely manner. If they miss their appointment by more than about two months, according to the Bone and Mineral Society, they are liable to have rapid bone loss and more fractures. And more fractures have been reported with this if they were more than two months overdue for their next injection, because like estrogen, you stop it, bone goes away. So it's excellent. They have now 10 years of data showing that as long as you stay on it, it increases bone. The rate of atraumatic fractures does not go up. So it's a nice alternative to a bisphosphonate, but you've got to remember, calcium on board and be sure and continue. If you are going to stop it, you have to put them on something else right away. Okay. Now this is our lady, our last lady, I think, with osteoporosis. She's 80 years old, and she prevents, presents with multiple vertebral fractures after lifting a plant pot off a shelf. Oh, I tell all my older patients, do not lift that heavy thing off the shelf. Don't try to open the window that's stuck, and don't pick the plant pot that weighs 30 pounds up, unless you can do it by bending your knees and picking it up, and nobody can, so that takes care of that one. So again, very careful with these people. As you get into your 80s, you have osteoporosis in the vertebral column. There's no doubt about it, unless you're one in about one in 2,000 people at the, at the age of 80 do not have osteoporosis in the vertebral column. So very important, no heavy lifting, particularly from over your head or picking up heavy items. So what she did was do a fracture, a T12, L1, and L2. Those are the most common places to fracture. She got all three of them. So DEXA scan showed a T-score of minus 3.9 at the left femoral neck. Oh, this lady should never fall down. And look, L1, L4 was one point plus 1.6. How do you think that ever happened? Her DEXA in the spine says she's fine. When you compress things, what happens to the bone mineral density? It gets higher at those sites, right? A flattened pancake is going to have a higher bone mineral density than a uh, non-flattened vertebra. So uh, that DEXA scan is going to lead you astray if you look at it. You need to, if they have a lot of back pain, you need either a, a film of the spine or you need an MRI because the DEXA doesn't tell you about compression fractures. Now, the more modern ones will give you a hint, but unless the radiologist catches it, you can get a DEXA report like this in a patient with multiple compression fractures. Okay, you'd like to try a bone stimulator. Well, maybe you wouldn't, but you should. <laughs> you wanna think about that. You want to use uh, a bone stimulator for this person. You want to use teriparatide porteo, which directly stimulates the osteoblasts. It's kind of too late to shut down the osteoclasts because at this age, this lady isn't building much bone and shutting down osteoclastic function will help, but not as rapidly as using a bone stimulator. That's from the Bone and Mineral Society this year. They say, these people, please try and use a bone stimulator, put that into your armamentarium. And these come in insulin pens. They're made by uh, the Lilly Corporation that makes insulin. So they come in an insulin pen, basically, very easy to use. They're approved for two years of use, and um, you can follow up with bisphosphonate therapy. Now, the other one, there are two of them out on the market. The one that just came out is a baloperatide. There's less experience with it, but it costs about half as much. So one of the other of those, you want to think about using a bone stimulator in your practice in a patient with a lot of vertebral compression fractures. And this is a baloperatide. It's similar. Uh, to Forteo or teriparatide is actually a piece of the parathyroid hormone molecule that stimulates bone growth. And a baloperatide is, is a piece of PTHRP, which is a tumor product that does the same thing as parathyroid hormone. So again, both approved, and the abaloperatide costs about half as much. But when you finish these, they're like genosumab. You can't just stop them because you lose all your bone. So you have to put them on a uh, bisphosphonate at the end. OK. So we're going to shift to thyroid. I'm sure all of you see patients with thyroid problems. And the news this year is that the U.S. Preventive Health Task Force says, do not screen the asymptomatic patient. And what they meant by asymptomatic is someone who comes to your office for their well woman exam. And they're 50 years old, 
do you need to get a TSH on those people? They say no. Um, how about somebody who comes when they're 65? TSH? No. It says if they're asymptomatic, don't get routine TSHs. Well, I want to show you this patient. This is an asymptomatic lady. She's 45 years old. She was brought to the ED after she had syncope at work. And she works in an upholstery section of a furniture factory. That's an important point. Her hemoglobin was four. Ooh, she was fairly anemic. Uh, her sodium was 124, and her TSH was 116. Normal is 3.74 in our lab. So she probably had significant hypothyroidism, right? Okay. Uh, free T4 was 0.6, so that was below normal. And her free T3 was also low. Her temperature was 97, and she had a pulse of 64. And she had a delayed reflex relaxation time. Now, what is that? Well, up is normal, down is slow, quite literally like so. And that's one of the key indicators of hypothyroidism, and it lasts for a time. So if you have patients on thyroid hormone and they say, oh, I'm not feeling too well, don't know if I'm on enough, and so on and so forth, that's a pretty good indicator that they're not on enough. Okay. So, hum, she said, you know, I really felt okay. I was kind of tired. Well, <laughs> She was really tired, I guess. Uh, her mother had hypothyroidism. Now, this is the flaw in the U.S. Preventive Health Task Force guideline. It's that when you begin to be hypothyroid, you just kind of feel sort of logy and tired and your hands tingly and your feet fall asleep. Well, as you become worse, your brain doesn't know this, and pretty soon you're asymptomatic. So the really horribly hypothyroid people usually tell you they don't feel much of anything at all. So. As a result of that, the Endocrine Society and ACE and the American Thyroid Association got together and said, okay, these are the people who you should screen when they come to your office. So these people come to your office, screen them for thyroid disease. That's the people with autoimmune disease. Thyroiditis is one of the most common autoimmune diseases in the United States. If you have one autoimmune disease, you're likely to have another. If you have type 1 diabetes, as we heard yesterday, I ought to screen you for thyroid disease. Type 1 diabetes is an autoimmune disease. Family history, very important. And then, of course, we cause a lot of thyroid disease. Uh, radiation to the head and neck, amiodarone for cardiac arrhythmias, one of the most common causes of hypothyroidism, the iatrogenic causes of hypothyroidism in this country. And, of course, lithium, chemotherapy, immunotherapy, uh, high-dose iodine. I've seen people who went on a seaweed kick and really gave themselves thyroiditis. So tell your patients you don't want to eat a lot of seaweed. It's not good for it. Uh, associated conditions. Atrial fibrillation, commonly associated with at least subclinical hyperthyroidism in patients over 60. So with atrial fibrillation, always ought to check, for, check the TSH. And we all hope that people with dementia, depression, and obesity are going to be hypothyroid so we can fix them. Oh, sorry about two to five percent of the time. But you always want to check. And finally, if you feel a palpable thyroid abnormality, as we said a couple of days ago, you ought to check those people. Okay. Also, recently, people have noticed that endocrine disrupting chemicals that bind to hormone receptors can actually cause hypothyroidism. They also can cause obesity by making adipocytes proliferate, as we'll see later in the morning. But in this case, this lady worked in an upholstery factory where they had polybrominated diphenyl ethers, and polybrominated diphenyl ethers bind to the thyroid hormone receptor and cause hypothyroidism. They're a common cause in Japan uh, where they, they do a lot of upholstery work. So again, upholstery factory people, indoor construction people, you want to screen them for hypothyroidism. Okay, so how are we going to replace these folks? Well, brand name thyroid hormone isn't necessary because all of these have to be high performance liquid chromatography similar from the FDA about five or six years ago. So any thyroxine will do, any levothyroxine will do. The American Thyroid Association says we should avoid preparations of thyroid that are combinations, or we should avoid using pork thyroid. There are a lot of different brands of pork thyroid. How many of you have patients on pork thyroid? 
Oh, yes, we all do, don't we? Because they want it. And most endocrinologists or, and a lot of people in primary care will put folks on combination therapy or put them on pork thyroid if they demand it. When your patient is pregnant, they probably shouldn't be on pork thyroid, although if they're already on it, I usually don't take them off. We, the reason for all of this is that we all make the amount of active hormone, or T3, we need every day. And if we're on a high carbohydrate diet, we make more. If we're sick, we make less. And so we need to make it every day, and we shouldn't probably be giving it to people. Because when you give them pork thyroid, you're giving them T3. You're giving them a fixed dose every day, and it's more than they would make. Humans don't make as much T3 as pigs. Read into that what you will. How much thyroxin? 1.6 mics per keg per day. It is a weight-based medication, just like insulin. Okay. The requirements are increased by things that speed metabolism, but you know, most people aren't on Fentoin anymore or phenobarbital, so that's not a concern. The concern is that you have to take your thyroid hormone about 30 minutes apart from any other medication because it's a negatively charged amino acid and believe me, lots of things complex it, particularly calcium, iron, and herbals. If you take your thyroxine with your iron tablet or your multivitamin, it complexes, goes right out the back end, gives you no benefit whatsoever. So be sure to tell your patients to take this one separately, but they don't have to take it in the morning. I got up at five o'clock to take my thyroxine. Oh, spare me. So, no, you can take it at bedtime. It has to be 30 minutes apart from any other food, beverage, or medication. Okay, so let's take a look at subclinical thyroid disease, the bane of many folks' existence. In subclinical hypothyroidism, the TSH is slightly elevated, the thyroid hormone, the circulating thyroid hormones are normal, the free T4, the T3, they are all normal. So what does that mean? That means part of the time, the thyroid isn't functioning adequately according to the pituitary. Remember, the pituitary makes TSH, and that tells you how well the thyroid is functioning. It's sort of the report card on thyroid function. So if the thyroid isn't functioning well, the TSH goes up. If the thyroid is overactive, the TSH goes down. So remember, that means that you're out of whack part of the time, but not a significant part of the time until the TSH is about 10 or more. So you do not have to treat subclinical disease unless the TSH is 10 or more, because statistically that's where the free T4 actually goes down a significant part of the time. And once that fact was known, the manufacturers of thyroxine preparations, who in large measure support places like the American Thyroid Association and the Endocrine Society, were a tad upset, to say the least. And so uh, the Endocrine Society said, well, heck, you know, follow your clinical judgment. If the patient, you think the patient's going to benefit from therapy, just, just treat the subclinical hypothyroidism. Then everyone was happy. But really, what you need to do is have clinical diseases determine the cause. It's usually thyroiditis. In older patients, it may well be things like amiodarone or high-dose iodine medications or chemotherapy. So you need to, to figure out what's going on there. And some of these subsets you ought to treat. If, if your TPO antibodies are high, somebody asked about TPO antibodies yesterday, they, they are inflammation of the thyroid indicators. They indicate the thyroid is fairly inflamed. And if the TSH is, say, 8, and the TPO antibodies are high, the chances are about 80% that patient's going to get hypothyroidism. So you ought to treat that patient. Uh, they suggest you treat patients with congestive heart failure because thyroxine increases cardiac contractility. And also, if you treat subclinical hypothyroidism in patients with chronic kidney disease, they do have a decrease in the rate of progression. So I ought to treat those folks. Now, this is a 72-year-old lady with angina and tachycardia, and she's on amiodarone, and her TSH is 10, and she had subclinical hypothyroidism. Free thyroxine was A-OK -okay at 1.2, and her ejection fraction was 58%. I said, gee, can I improve on that? No. So we decided not to treat that lady because although her TSH is 10, she had a normal ejection fraction. She was doing very well and she had no symptoms. So we said, we're going to watch this. 
And if you have a TSH of 10 and you decide not to treat, you've got to watch that patient pretty carefully. So we said, you know, tell us if you don't feel well. Tell us if you, if you begin to have a problem with breathing. What's going to happen? When her TSH goes up above 10, her injection fraction is going to go down. So we told her what symptoms. We gave her a list of symptoms. I would urge you to do that. If you're monitoring someone that's on the edge of disaster, tell them what to look for. And we said, we'll, get, we'll see you in a month. Okay, so she called in about three weeks and she said, oh, you know, I just don't feel well. I can't walk as far. I don't breathe as well. And her TSH was 30. Oh, my goodness, yes, the, this, this can come on. It can change to significant hypothyroidism fairly rapidly. And her ejection fraction, unfortunately, was also low. So we uh, actually put her on 12 and a half micrograms of thyroxine eased it up every two weeks very slowly until her ejection fraction was back in the 50s and we watched her on that. So the, you're not necessarily going to make the TSH normal in some of the patients you treat for hypothyroidism. You're going to look at the other parameters. In this case, you're going to look at the ejection fraction. So treat or not to treat? The 65-year-old lady with a TSH of 5.25. Normal is 3.74. And she was screamed because she, she had a strong family history of thyroid disease. Remember, most thyroid disease is hereditary. She's asymptomatic. She has normal weight. She has no constipation, uh, normal cardiac function. She's really thinking pretty well. And OK, would you treat this lady with levothyroxine? How many, how many yes? Put your quarter on them. On your, OK, some, some people would. Okay, well, the American Thyroid Association says no, because in this age group, a TSH of four to six is normal. And what we're finding out now is that people over the age of 70 begin to have a TSH that's a little higher, uh, men, both men and women. I know it's the women's conference, but have particularly women. And so when you see that, they're saying this is probably normal for age. And the treatment in some studies has been shown to, in, to, to increase the rate at which they die. Oh, thank you, no. Uh, we'd like to decrease mortality in our patient population. So you don't have to treat these people who are a little above normal. If they get to 10, or the free T4 is normal, or they have significant symptoms, then you may want to treat them. But you don't have to treat these people as a rule. And the American Thyroid Association suggests that we don't screen these people unless they have an indication on that list I showed you at the beginning. Okay. okay, so as we round up here, let's talk about subclinical hyperthyroidism, low TSH, normal thyroid hormones that are circulating. So part of the time that means, that means the circulating thyroid hormones are elevated, but not a significant part of the time really, really need to look for multinodular goiter in the older patient with subclinical hyperthyroidism because the nodules in that goiter are autonomous and as time goes by and the goiter grows, they shut off the pituitary and the TSH gets low. So you want to obtain an ultrasound in any older patient that has subclinical hyperthyroidism. You want to take a look there. Because if the TSH is 0.1 or less, you're really going to try and treat those people. If you look, the atrial fibrillation rate in patients with subclinical hyperthyroidism, that's down here in red, is exactly the same as an overt hyperthyroidism. So it's a really incredible risk factor in older patients for atrial fibrillation. So don't miss that one. Be sure you get a TSH in those people. Be sure you get an ultrasound. Right? Keep following that TSH. If it goes below 0.1, you've got to do something about it. Again, the guidelines, if your TSH is 0.1 to 0.45, really minimal problems, even in elderly patients. But as the TSH gets to less than 0.1, in the elderly 0.1 even, you want to be very sure you watch because of the increased risk of atrial fibrillation. And in women, an increased risk of vertebral fracture as their TSH stays below 0.1 for a significant amount of time. Okay. Okay, this is a 75-year-old lady with a uh, TSH of 0 0.07, so she's less than 0.1. Free T4 is 1.2, free T3 is 3.5. So those are both normal. She's asymptomatic, no weight loss, no muscle weakness, her pulse is okay. Um, 
but she does have osteoporosis and she has atrial arrhythmias. You're listening to the heart and she's having you know, rhythm problems and, and every once in a while she has two or three extra beats. Ah, atrial arrhythmias lead to atrial fibrillation, so she's a lady at higher risk. Again, you're gonna look at her, you're gonna say, well, TSH is less than 0.1. I'm gonna treat her, but I'm gonna look at the cause. I'm gonna get a thyroid ultrasound. She had a multinodular goiter. So what are the indications for therapy? TSH of 0.1 or less, essentially, in this older patient with a multinodular goiter, or a mass effect. If she has tracheal compression, you're gonna get rid of that multinodular goiter, and that's why it's so incredibly important to get the ultrasound in this patient. And low TSH affects your ejection fraction, makes, it, uh, makes the filling time shorter, and also gives you osteopenia, osteoporosis, and vertebral fractures. So you're gonna treat this lady with low dose methimazole, and usually about five milligrams twice a day. Really low doses do a good job. You get the TSH in the mid-range normal, and she does very well. Be sure whenever you use methimazole or propothiouracil, you talk to the patient. It can, they can cause a granulocytosis, particularly in your older patient, but also in your younger patient. You're using high doses for Graves' disease. They can get a granulocytosis. They can get liver failure. So you need to mention those. They're rare side effects, but on, you know, when, if the patient has a problem with an infection or if they get jaundice, they need to call you right away. The sooner you stop the medication, the more likely the problem is to resolve without permanent problems for the patient. Okay, so we talked to her about that. Um, this is an 82-year-old with weight loss, about 10% of her body weight. Oh, she's down to 90 pounds. She's had weight loss for 12 weeks, and she says, oh, I just feel exhausted. Her blood pressure is 90 over 60. Her pulse is 130. She has proptosis. Extraocular movements are intact. When you have someone with hyperthyroidism, be sure you check those extraocular muscles. Very simple, I'm not blessing you, I'm just showing you how to, in that short a period of time in your office, you have done it, and you know whether they have extraocular impairment. If they do, they can get blindness. So you really need to get those people over to the ophthalmologist. It only takes you a few seconds to check that out. Muscle weakness, whoa, couldn't get up from a chair. That's the simplest way to test for proximal muscle weakness. Thyroid was enlarged, non-nodular, and she didn't have congestive failure, luckily. TSH is 0 0.01. Free T4, oh, upper limits of normal. Total T3, very high. So again, sometimes these people have T3 toxicosis. Older person, hyperthyroidism, measure TSH, free T4, and total T3. You want to measure all of those because T3 toxicosis is, is more common in this older age group. Okay, you say, does she have Graves' disease or thyroiditis? I don't know. And yesterday I, I noticed that, that uh, you'd use the TSH receptor antibody. And so again, you're familiar with that because now you use it in pregnant ladies with Graves. So you get a TSH receptor antibody for those people. If that's positive, they have Graves' disease and you treat it with high dose methimazole. You don't want to treat it long term. So unlike the pregnant lady, you're treating her till the end of pregnancy, third trimester, you can taper off the meds usually. She gets a resurgence after delivery. This lady is at high risk all the time and you're gonna treat her definitively. You're not just gonna tide her over with methimazole. You're gonna treat her with radioactive iodine or surgery. Please. You don't want to keep people with significant Graves' disease on long-term methimazole. For the time of pregnancy, it's fine, but hmm, long-term definitive therapy for Graves' disease, it will kill you in the end if you don't get rid of it. Okay, so um, subclinical disease, you're going to use your clinical judgment and base your therapy on what you're going to improve. Uh, be sure that in hyperthyroidism you look for the risk of complications, you want to look for eye disease, and you want to use definitive therapy. Okay, well that's it, and so uh, if anybody has any questions, we have a few minutes for questions. <coughs> and there's Randy with his throwable mic. I just want to confirm you were talking about um, when to take a drug holiday based on bone density and you were using the T-scores. If you have someone with a good T-score but a horrendous FRAX, does that make a difference? 
Yeah, you wouldn't use the fracs to look at the drug holiday beginning because hopefully, with any luck, you have changed the risk with your bisphosphonate. So once you've used a bisphosphonate, the frax no longer holds true because it's always going to think you're worse than you are. Hopefully, I've made you better. That's the whole idea. And so uh, you don't use the frax for that. You can use it if you're getting off the drug holiday. Again, they do in England, but we don't here. Yes. Just when you were talking about when to stop the bisphosphonate, if the T-score remains low and you say continue it for another three years, recheck the DEXA, you just keep doing that indefinitely or is there come a point where you are stopping the bisphosphonate? About 10 years, uh, we don't have much data for more than 10 years. That's the only data we have. So the Bone and Mineral Society suggests that after 10 years that you transition. Now you say, oh gosh, I'm worried they've been on bisphosphonate for five years and, and I'm a little worried. You can transition at any time to a bone stimulator. And then that causes turnover again. So if you're worried about- I'm worried the, about the patient whose T-score is still low. Right. So transitioning to a bone stimulator will actually treat the low T-score that will enhance bone mineral development. Can I ask one more? Uh, uh -huh. Sure. Okay. Uh, so no, you're limited to one. No. Uh, <laughs> yes, so, so, I, so I have a patient who's 58, morbidly obese, diabetic, 90 total units of insulin a day, history of BOOP, periodically on high dose sustained courses of steroids. Mm -hmm. I'll be honest, I don't have a DEXA on her, but I'm going to assume, given her morbid obesity, it's actually going to be pretty good. Mm -mm. Actually, it's interesting that we used to think that. And obesity without diabetes is somewhat protective for your bones, but obesity with diabetes is not. And so they don't have that protection. They, you know, obese people, why are they protected? They have muscle mass, okay? And they have hyperinsulinemia. So both of those are somewhat protective. But if your matrix is poor, as it is in type 2 diabetes, that lady isn't protected. And so uh, probably ought to get a DEXA. But she is postmenopausal, right? So she's going to be high risk on steroids. So you're going to probably. So we don't care about her DEXA. Correct. Uh, I, mean, you, I you would, would still care about her dex. It but, gives me a baseline. But if it was no, if it was in a good range, would you still be concerned enough to treat? Mm, I would make the correction by subtracting the 0.5 from her T-score, and I would put her in frax. She's had no fractures, so I would put her in frax and take a look, because I still would be concerned about that. And the, that happens. Actually, that's a very good point because I see people that can't get into the dexa. Our dexa <laughs> won't take people that are 300 because it says it bothers the ratchets. You know, it just, they won't, they can't move the table. So um, in some cases, you're going to have to do without the deck set. And in that case, I use the frax on that lady. Okay. You mentioned that when you're over, I can't remember the age, that a higher TSH was okay. In Is there any evidence that a lower TSH, I mean, when you set a TSH of 10, I think you gave everybody who does OB a little bit of a heart attack because when we see a pregnant patient with a TSH of 10, we're very upset. Do you treat reproductive age women more aggressively on their TSH? And Actually, is there evidence that if you're younger that your TSH should be lower or is that 10? kind of across the board. Right. Well, after yesterday, I kind of took that off my slide here. But uh, if you look at the, t the reproductive age woman, ACE says that all reproductive age women should have a T-score, I uh, mean a T-score, well, wrong disease, a TSH of two and a half or less. And they suggest we keep all reproductive women at two and a half or less, because then we don't necessarily have to change the thyroid hormone when they become pregnant. Because if their TSH is already like one, for example, they frequently don't need more thyroxine than they have already. So they suggest we just keep them less than two and a half. Now subclinical hypothyroidism in the re reproductive age woman, ACE says you probably ought to treat it. And T score, uh, TSH of minus two and, uh, of two and a half, okay, or less. Um, the other folks, if, if you're pregnant and you have positive TPO antibodies, there's some people that say you should treat subclinical hypothyroidism because they feel that in small studies, the outcome of pregnancy is different. So pregnant people are a different breed. And elderly, people over the age of 60, luckily, except in, you know, in the newspapers, don't become pregnant. So we can use the ATA guidelines. But they start at 60. Okay, thank you.